Hi, this is Mike Fry with No Kill Learning, and this is No Kill in Motion, your monthly podcast of the goings on in the No Kill movement. With Aubrey Cavanaugh, author, advocate, and founder of No Kill Huntsville, Alan Rosenberg, the New Jersey Animal Observer, and David Smith, president of No Kill Colorado. Today on No Kill in Motion, desperate times call for desperate measures. We've previously talked about a rebranding of the traditional animal sheltering called socially conscious sheltering. It's a way of describing the old catch and kill model of sheltering using clever marketing and fluffy language. Since the last time we talked about it, there's been some new developments. Plus, some large national organizations are making a money grab in New Jersey with a proposed new law that would allow animal shelters to extort money from people using their pets as hostages. I've also got some really exciting news from my hometown of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Stick with us, you're not going to want to miss a minute of this. Hi, welcome back. Uh, thanks for watching and listening. Uh, and welcome, David, Aubrey, and uh, Alan. Uh, what an exciting uh, conversation we're going to have today. But I want to first start, before we get into talking about our two main topics of the day, by saying that I am so excited to ha have some news from my hometown of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And that is that for the last two months, they have had a save rate of uh, over 95%. Uh, which means that, from my perspective, um, they are the last shelter in the Twin City metro area in Minnesota to be over the 90% threshold and arguably um, at or very near the no-kill uh, goal here, uh, which means that if, that's, if it's true and if they sustain that, it means the greater Twin City metro area, population of 3.23 million people, will become the largest no-kill community in the United States. And I could not possibly be happier or more thrilled about it. I have been working to achieve that goal for 20 years. And I, you know, I, I get all choked up because, like, we're, we're just on the precipice. We're almost there. Um, any thoughts about that? Any of you, just feel free to jump in. Well, first of all, this is David. Um, congratulations, Mike. I mean, this is great. I know you've been working on that for a long time. You ran, you know, arguably the best shelter in America uh, in that area and tried to convince others that they could do the same. The fact that Minneapolis is doing this is huge news for this, huge news for us. Um, really look forward to seeing, you know, a 12 month cycle where they actually maintain this. So this is uh, just the best news we've had. Yeah, I'd say. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Go sorry. ahead, Al. Okay, um, I, I was just going to say it just truly vindicates. Um, the brand of activism and advocacy I think we all have been advocating for. Um, I know Mike has been doing this uh, for several years or more than several years, but he's been persistent and it's truly showing that a shelter can do this without, you know, getting massive amounts of donations from national organizations or, uh, you know, bringing all these other folks in. It's, you know, it looks like it just took a few simple things and uh, for the shelter to do that advocates wanted, and boom, they're, they're, they're starting to save all healthy, treatable animals when they weren't before. So it's, it's really exciting, and considering the size of the city yeah. uh, and a number of people and pet owners affected, I think we all have to be uh, thrilled with this news. Well, I'll chime in too and just say that, you know, I think a lot of times opposition tries to make it sound like the no-kill philosophies and the no-kill equation that we promote only work in small communities. And this just shows that that's not true, that, that there are huge communities where those philosophies can be put in place. And it's not like the public suddenly got more responsible. What happened was the manner in which officials were functioning and thinking. And the other thing that it shows us is that this is not a sprint. I mean, it's it, it's a marathon. And as long as you stay on subject, keep making it clear that you're paying attention and that you're you're holding authorities accountable, 
Um, yes, it can take a long time. In your in your case, Mike, a couple of decades. But I mean, here we are, and oh my gosh, no no looking back. It's all forward thinking, moving on. So I like David. Like I'm, I'll be anxious to see what a twelve month uh, statistical study looks like. Well, it's so funny about it that I think is so interesting is, you know, it, you, it is a marathon, not a sprint. I think that's a great way to say it. But if you look at the 20 year history at Minneapolis Animal Control, um, the success, the, 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 the switch that was flipped happened very quickly. Um, you know, January of this year, um, they had only about a 70 percent save rate and Throughout the whole beginning part of this year, they continued to have their heels pretty dug in and resisted and resisted and resisted. It's really just been within the last few months that changes began there. And so literally within a very short period of time, they went from, you know, a 30 percent kill rate to a 96 percent save rate. And, you know, from my perspective, once they've made those reforms and they can see how what's possible because they've actually done them. Number one, they can't say it's impossible anymore because they've done it and it becomes much more difficult to go backwards. And so it, it is going to be a fascinating story to watch unfold. And anyway, I couldn't be happier, but we've got to dive into these other topics, big topics, really important information coming out of New Jersey, Alan. So I'm going to go to you first and um, talk about this this proposed bill. There's a hearing tomorrow, and unfortunately, this video isn't going to be out by tomorrow. So by the time people are watching this, the hearing will have already taken place. I want you to explain what the bill is about. Um, I'm frankly pretty horrified about the proposed law um, that's being supported by organizations like the ASPCA, but I think it puts people and their pets at serious risk. Um, so give our listeners a Thanks, run. Thanks, Mike, and, and I do appreciate uh, you giving a national audience uh, some uh, information about this, this bill. Uh, so basically, this cost of care bill is where someone has their animals seized for alleged animal cruelty. And the concern has always been is that many allegations of animal cruelty are not real animal cruelty. They're either ignorant law enforcement officials or overzealous law enforcement officials. So under the bill, basically, if your pets are seized, every uh, month you have to prepay the shelter's estimated cost of care for that animal, which would be far in excess than what a normal pet owner would pay. And each month they would continue to have to make these payments until the court case was decided. So the best way to illustrate this is to just run some real quick numbers. So let's say you have six cats. Not unusual. A lot of pet owners have six cats. And an overzealous law enforcement official takes the cats away and says, oh, you know, you're committing cruelty and you weren't. Um, you would have to pay, let's say the, the shelter assesses you $15 per day per animal and the court case takes six months. You'd have to pay $16,200 uh, to care to, 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 to pay the shelter for those cats, plus any veterinary costs, which you know that there would be at shelters. Um, or you would have to surrender your animals. And if you once you surrender your animals, they can kill it, to kill the animals right away. And even if you're found innocent, it doesn't matter. You don't get your animals back. And if they're killed, it's too bad. So basically people are being convicted before they're actually found guilty. And what's going to happen is people are just going to give up their animals. They're not going to fight. They're not going to be able to afford this. I mean, I think the average person would not have $16,000 in this example to pay, and let alone poor people and people, and particularly people in minority communities are going to be abused by this, as they have historically been uh, taken advantage by uh, overbearing animal control and sheltering agencies. So really... Well, the, an important thing to remember is that, you know, I think most anybody who's been involved in animal sheltering or animal welfare for any length of time has had experiences of, you know, very heavy handed animal shelters, animal control who, you know, will go out and retaliate against, you Absolutely. know, whistleblowers. And this would give them a tool to use to you know, basically extort money from people or extort behaviors from people. Um, and, uh, you know, I find it 
you know, to me, an obvious violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, you know, due process. You know, that's an right. important part of, you know, our society where you're not supposed to be able to, you know, charge people um, and punish them until they've been, you know, yeah, and the show and the show and, and the national and organization. So to be clear, it's HSUS, ASBCA, and I believe Best Friends as well. Best Friends hasn't made any official statements, but they have made some statements on my page that seem to suggest that they may be supportive of this bill. And you know, this this is really dangerous because what they're saying is, oh well, you know, the the the, the people are just paying the cost they would normally incur to to house these animals and it's only fair and it's just not true no one is paying 15 or 30 dollars per day to provide basic sustenance to their animal to clean and feed clean after and feed their animal it's not happening and they're certainly not going to be incur you know the thought, veterinary costs these shelters are going to assess uh based on just the, the inherent risk and cost in a shelter um, and then you add the fact that some shelters are just bad. They don't vaccinate animals upon intake. They don't provide prompt veterinary care or good socialization. And, you know, those veterinary costs will be many times higher than, you know, you would have if your pet is in your home. So it's, it's just really just nonsense, this argument that they're trying to put forth. And, you know, my belief is that this bill is literally, it's really about fundraising. I think a lot of these organizations like to fundraise off these cruelty cases, whether they're real or not. And the only thing holding them back is, well, they have to care for some animals. They have to do some work. And they don't want to do that work. They just want to do the fundraising. And it's really going to put every pet owner at risk of losing their animal. It's, it's just incredibly dangerous. So I um, think... I think I think there's a problem with the fact that, it, you know, it's it's a punitive law. Whenever we see punitive laws on um, pet owners, um, it does seem to be more mon money vo motivated than anything. Um, you know, I, I, I can't think of one offhand. I'm sure one of you can. But but the, the punitive idea is not in the interest of the pets. It's not in the interest of the pet owners, especially before they're found guilty. You know, we all want um, neglectful or abusive pet owners to be taken to account. But until you know that, to make someone pay that kind of money in Jersey shelters that you're talking about, Alan, you follow them. Um, they do have a, a history or a present of actually killing healthy and treatable pets. So if they get ownership of them, there's no protection of them. And I did find um, uh, questions put out there by uh, Lee Greenwood from uh, Best Friends. He didn't take a stand. Best Friends didn't take a stand in that. But he was questioning your interpretation of the law. And I was really sad to see that because I'd hate to think that um, Best Friends would come out against this law. I don't think it's in the interest of pets. And so I don't think it's in the interest of their organization to do so. I think you were meant to say you meant to say you hope Best Friends would come out against it because I think they they ha Best Friends has come out against similar laws in other places. Yes, yes and, they uh, have. And um, and so, you know, I would frankly be horrified if they end up supporting the law. I mean, I think that the numbers of problems with it are are enormous, uh, it, totally unrelated to the New Jersey cost of care bill. A Facebook friend of mine just posted a photo of her dog online on Facebook, I think it was. And she said, you know, this is my beloved pet. She's like, you know, 13 years old. Um, she has all this long list of medical issues. So she's practically bald. Her hair is falling out. And she's got scabs. She's got very bad dental issues. But her heart conditions are so bad, she can't have anesthesia to get the dental work done. And she went down this whole long list of things. And she said, you know, chances are, if she was ever picked up at most animal shelters, they would believe that I was a cruel owner who is committing cruelty right. by not caring for this pet, but she goes to the vet and she's got all this stuff going on. And I think that that's absolutely true. Far too And that's often, the problem with this law. Yeah, That absolutely. is the problem with this law. And so shelters could misinterpret what they're seeing and end up harming people and pets unintentionally more problematic is they could actually use the law to harm people intentionally and we know animal shelters well, can i can i give an example of something um, that we had so, happen uh, in my area recently in huntsville alabama we had 
a situation where a number of dogs were taken from a home as part of a cruelty case. There were a lot of small dogs, and to be honest, I can't remember the number off the top of my head. I want to, I want to say it was 60 or 70 dogs. And um, had a law like this been in effect in our area, I mean, think of how much money that would have been to cover cost of care even for one month. But what happened was the shelter, like you talked about immediately began fundraising off of these animals, right? And the fundraising was supposed to be targeted. It was for their veterinary care. It was for their care. So if you have a cost of care law, but then you're fundraising at the same time, you're essentially double dipping based on people's emotions, right? You're essentially saying on one hand, you're presumed guilty ahead of time. So you have to pay in advance and, oh, but we're going to fundraise off of it. So if, if the, if fundraising covers their cost of care, then why are you giving someone the presumption of guilt? That doesn't make any sense. And a lot of money was raised. I mean, when, when people see animals right. that they even perceive to have been mistreated, even if they were not, I mean, it tugs on their heartstrings and, and people, people donate, um, cause they want to, it's, it's an easy way to do something that's selfless to help an animal that, that requires care. Um, on the, on the, on the issue of being consistent, Um, we had a law that was enacted in Alabama a couple years ago called Emily's Law, and it's essentially a dangerous dog law. And it was brought after there were a couple of dog bite fatality attacks that happened in a couple of counties with dogs that had been running at large. And um, it it moved like grease lightning um, through our legislature. I mean, it it went through committee super fast. Um, We were having trouble keeping up with how quickly it was moving. And I actually got an email message from some folks at Best Friends Animal Society with their concerns about the law interested in me being more vocal about it or what could they do to, to slow the roll of this bill. And one of the things that they expressed concern about was the cost of care provision. Um, so it's, it's, it's confusing to me that when we were doing a dangerous dog law in Alabama, which ultimately got enacted, that they were worried about cost of care, um, but that they might be in support of this law in New Jersey. My hope is that, that they really haven't taken a position yet and that when they do take a position – that they will actually speak out against it or seek some type of amendment to it so that it's not punitive in nature and we're not presuming people's guilt. Yeah, and I think one thing, those are all really, really good po- Those are all really, really good points. There's one thing that I wanna really highlight in what you said and really maybe expand on it just a little bit. Um, you know, you talked about how, um, oh now, <laughs> brain fart, I just completely forgot. <laughs> Um, anyway, I, know, I, I just want to stress one thing that, that I think everyone should, uh, cons- uh, uh, you know, understand is, you know, there is the shelter, the arguments that the national organizations are making is, oh, well, you know, these dogs are held a long time in these court cases while they're adjudicated. And the answer is not to put, take this bill to unfairly steal someone's pet or, and kill them. The answer is to allow shelters in these cases to put the animals in foster homes. So, you know, there, if you look at what's going on in some of the best shelters uh, who have large scale foster programs, for example, there's a Pima Animal Care Facility in, in Tucson, Arizona area. They literally have, what, like 5,000 animals to foster uh, in the last year. Um, and I think they only have three dogs in, in their entire shelter that have a length of stay of over 90 days. Um, they have a 90 plus percent uh, dog live release rate. And it's because they have a huge foster program. So the point is, if, if, if you will simply put a bill that allows shelters to do foster care, shelters should be able to place almost all the dogs into foster homes. The few dogs that don't remain in fo- that don't go to foster care for whatever behavior reason or whatever other reason, you know, you just, the, the answer is to provide more uh, high, require shelters to do, uh, provide more enrichment and better enrichment in, the, in, their, shel- in their shelters. Uh, Nathan Winograd posted two studies recently uh, in peer-reviewed scientific journals that show that um, if you give animal dogs uh, better enrichment and put them in a proper environment in a shelter, stress actually goes down over their length of stay at the shelter. So the the bill is completely misguided. They need to scrap it and just completely go with that can approach. I, that can I say approach, something uh, about the foster? People pets. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I realized... I realized what I, that's all very good stuff, Alan. Thank you for that. And I realized the thing that I wanted to say, I wanted to go back to what um, Aubrey was talking about with this double dipping, because I think that's all absolutely true. In some ways, I think it's even worse because there's a point that needs to be made about that. So, um, you know, they're trying to charge these people the money. The shelters are trying to charge the people the money. But the fact of the matter is 
the costs of that are paid by the municipality. When you know a cruelty case comes about and law enforcement is involved, it is the municipality's job to pay the cost of that care. Um, so they're trying to get the money paid by the owners to the shelter up front, they'll get reimbursed or paid by the municipality. And at the same time, they'll go ahead and do the fundraising that we've all seen them do over and over and over again. So that's almost like triple dipping um, because they will absolutely, you know, we've all seen it, you know, do that fundraising, even though in every one of those cases, if it's a cruelty case involving law enforcement, the costs of the care of those animals will be paid by the government. Yeah, and, and, I, and the I'd thing like to is, say my, the thing is my, so anyway, sorry, go ahead, Aubrey. I was just going to say something quick about the foster issue, because I was having a conversation with a lawyer about this the other day, actually, um, a lawyer that does municipal defense. And um, what that person said was, well, it's unrealistic to think that you should be able to put all these animals in foster homes because then you're filling up foster homes with animals um, when those foster homes should be used for other animals who are already in the shelter because they were found running a, running at large, whatever. And, and my counter to that is this. Every time we have a, a, a cruelty type case where an allegation has been made, not only are people willing to donate, but people tend to line up to adopt these animals yeah. if they become available for adoption ultimately. So you can still, you can use that same public goodwill and the desire to help these animals to find even more foster homes than you may already have. Like if you go out there and say, oh, we're not only fundraising for these 60 small breed dogs, but we're looking for short term foster homes while the case is adjudicated. Will you help us for this short term period? You're going to have people that are stepping up that are offering to do that again because they want to do something to help. And the good news about that is ultimately once the case is adjudicated, if it turns out the person is guilty and that animal can be adopted out to a new home, it may end up in that foster home. It's an interesting thing, you know, the conversation, by the way, Alan, you did a really good job of, of highlighting this bill that's, you know, coming up in New Jersey on the New Jersey um, Animal Observer website and Facebook page. Um, I thought it was fascinating to watch uh, the ASPCA's representatives out there, um, I think, grossly misrepresenting the bill, um, you know, not appreciating the fact that we do actually have a constitution in the United States that guarantees people are supposed to be... Um, have due process of law available to them so they can't have their pets taken away from them and seized and killed or have money extorted from them until they've you know, actually been through the whole legal process. Um, that's supposed to be the way it works here in the United States. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm glad you've put this out there, put it and made people aware of it. Um, I'm really kind of horrified by the fact that one of the things that um, that I brought up in having a conversation with the ASBCA is this reminds me very much of what is called civil forfeiture, um, um, a very controversial law that very few people support that has been widely abused by law enforcement across the United States. And as a result of it, um, there's been some you know constitutional challenges and some things have had to change about it. And that's the law that allows law enforcement to be, be able to seize any property that they believe is involved in a crime um, and keep it. So, you know, they've had police officers stealing cash and, you know, taking people's cars and homes before that they've been, you know, adjudicated. Um, and that's clearly been shown to be unconstitutional. When I put, when I said to the ASPCA, this law is basically the animal version of civil forfeiture, they responded by saying, Oh, civil forfeiture is horrible. We don't support that. And this is not like that because the thing that's different is civil forfeiture is clearly an overt money grab. This is not that. Well, yes, it is. You are yeah, clearly is. out there it's, it's demanding. It's exactly the same thing. <laughs> you, it's exactly the same thing. You're extorting money from people. It's about grabbing the cash. There's no other reason for this bill other than to go f make a money grab about it. So, you know, ASPCA, stop misrepresenting what this bill is about. It is about grabbing money. Uh, we've got to move on, though, because we've got a whole other topic to get to. And we gotta, have to go to David next and because we've been talking about socially conscious sheltering, which is really, I just say it's a rebranding, a labeling of the old traditional catch and kill model um, of sheltering. Um, and some shelters in, in Colorado have been busy uh, trying to spread that around. Can you tell us what's going on these days with socially conscious sheltering in Colorado, David? 
Yeah, so in order to, um, you know, oppose no kill, the large shelters in the state have tried this uh, several different times. Current, their current version is socially conscious sheltering. If you look at it, if you look out there and find it, it's really, it's just a whole bunch of platitudes. We should care for animals. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's based on the five freedoms, which you talked about on this, uh, on a different segment of No Kill in Motion before, mm-hmm. where it's based on the, the, uh, the premise that was created in England for livestock, which are animals that are actually born to be ultimately killed. So they created socially conscious sheltering built on those five freedom premise, and they're putting it out there. And it doesn't really say anything except we should be nice to animals for the most part. Um, it also says that you should support the large animal welfare groups, which of course that's in their interest. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I look at this and I think of... The first time I met the large shelters uh, uh, a f- few years back uh, when No Kill Colorado was still fairly young, and we sat down and we were talking about the No Kill equation. They're obviously uncomfortable with the word kill, which I'm uncomfortable with the word kill. But the fact is the word kill and the word euthanize are two different words, and that's what I was talking to them about. And they said, well, the No Kill equation is, you know, is so disruptive. Could we call it the humane equation. They wanted to change that. And you probably nobody listening to this remembers that because it, it died as quickly as I hope socially conscious sheltering does because it had the same kind of platitudes and missed the primary goal that we believe in this movement is the primary goal of sheltering, that we do not kill a healthy or treatable pet. It's the one thing they leave out of this entire thing. And without that inside of any shelter... Um, you know, proposition that you put forth, what's the point? You know, making sure that they have fresh water and food is really kind of useless if their lives are forfeit any time a regressive shelter director wants to uh, wants to take that. So it, it's the same thing as they've tried to do several times before. Um, they're trying it again. Um, you know, they get, they're putting a lot of money in marketing in it. They have a lot of money. You know, the, the groups in Colorado that are backing this have over a hundred million in assets and they pull in, you know, probably well over 50 million a year and in donations and stuff. So they put a lot of money to marketing. They're very professional about it, but it's, it's, it's an empty, it's an empty premise. There's nothing there. It just says, let's shelter. They've launched some really glossy, um, marketing around it recently which shows they're perfectly happy to put a lot of money into marketing and branding and labeling that you know if they just put that money into like saving lives wouldn't that be so much better that's what i just keep thinking right. whenever i see that stuff me um, too I, and, I the and the thing is you know they they talk about these five freedoms like you know freedom from pain and suffering that's all great but if you think about it without the freedom to live freedom from pain and suffering can be just an excuse to kill those animals, which is exactly what it is, because they don't include the freedom to live within it. And which um, is the post the post I put out a little while ago, um, it's on no kill movement, I believe, is the freedom to kill, because that's what it gives them. It gives them the freedom to kill while they sound like really compassionate groups. And I won't accept that. I, I mean, I just won't accept them being able to say that when the fact is they leave out the part that we are going to save every healthy or treatable pet. They say, we're going to care for the pets we decide to care for. And that's it. Well, and I think that they're they're doing this because they're feeling pressure. They're feeling desperate. And you know, as I say, desperate times call for desperate measures. Um, and there's some prominent people in Colorado that are starting to talk no kill and and maybe talk about that a little bit, too. I mean, I think that that's their 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 promotion of the socially conscious sheltering, I believe, is a direct response well, to that. Well, ju- just yesterday, I had the good fortune to go to the governor's mansion. The first gentleman of Colorado is a great animal advocate, um, a great compassionate man. And, um, you know, he had an adoption event at the governor's mansion. The second one he had, he had a Max Fund and Ferret Dreams there, two no-kill organizations. And he prominently said that when he introduced them. He's willing to do any shelter. You know, the fact is saving animals. I don't, when somebody says, where should I adopt from? 
I'm like, you adopt anywhere that you can adopt. Let's get, you know, let's just get them home. It doesn't matter. But the fact is he brought them in there. He's showing that what he cares about is organizations that save lives. And so, you know, we're seeing that, you know, we are making a difference. Um, Colorado gets better every year. I believe no kill advocates have a lot to do with that. And I think we're going to continue to see it. And socially conscious sheltering, I think it's just going to peter out because, uh, you know, platitudes are platitudes. They sound good, but they're not, they, you know, when, they, they're, they're not a passion because first... they don't care enough. And there's no accountability in it. There's there's no right. measure of success. There's no ultimate goal in a, in there. And you know right. all the fluffy language in the world doesn't get it to an end result. Um, and the end result is when what we first we all started talking see. about this. So it's the same thing they've said over and over. Same thing that they said over right. and over. They just keep changing. Well, it's, the it's name. Just, yeah. That's all. It's. It's the same players. When we first name. started yeah. talking about this before, it related to the Denver Dumb Friends League, which has lots and lots and lots and lots of money. And there mm -hmm. were some people within um, that organization that were promoting this this new phrase, so, socially conscious sheltering, which if you were to ask the person, a common person on the street, they might not even realize you were talking about animals. They might think you were talking about homeless people. Um, but the Denver right. Dumb Friends League, they were, right. they were writing all these articles and some of them were just blatantly against the no-kill movement. What, what's, what's changed recently is they now have a different website about socially conscious sheltering, and that's, that's all it talks about. But when you look at the contact email, it's still for the Denver Dumb Friends League. So they've created a totally separate platform, which it's very polished. It's got all these infographics, which look pleasant. But I was looking back over it this morning. When you look at the content, Honestly, it's a lot of words that really say nothing. Um, it's it's kind of like a, the the animal welfare version of political speak, where there's lots of words and lots of fancy pictures being thrown at you. But the, at the end of the day, you're left with, and what's this supposed to mean? The other thing well, that's they, happened is, in addition to us, um, I mean, I think that we were the first group really to speak out and say, hey, um, to call this is what it was. We do now have other voices that are speaking with us. Um, Nathan Winograd did a blog about sh socially unconscionable sheltering, and, and, he, and he referred to socially <laughs> conscious sheltering this way. He said it's just one more move in a string of failed efforts to maintain the status quo. We also have Animal Farm Foundation has spoke out against it, and in spite of our, our issues with best friend and their best friends and their positioning, even best friends has spoken out about it and said that it lacks delineable goals, benchmarks of, of success, and accountability. And that's a fancy way of saying there's just nothing there. It's lots of words and pictures, but there's there's nothing there. It's about maintaining the status quo. As well as Austin and American Pets Alive. They've both spoken out against it as well. I mean, it's, a, 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 you know, any, anyone who's out to save every healthy or treatable pet realizes that socially conscious sheltering is as it's as much of a platitude in title as it is in substance. It's snake oil. I'm sorry. It's just snake it oil. It is. <laughs> yes. It's it sounds great, but there's no substance whatsoever. Well, everybody, it's been great. Um, great conversation again. Um, thank you, Alan. Thank you, David. Thank you, Aubrey. Um, and again, I just want to put it out there that the hearing on the cost of care bill in New Jersey is tomorrow. This video will be out after that. And so be sure to check out the and I would just add, Animal Observer. I would just um, add that, that if it, by the time people watch this video, if it passed the committee, it may be going for a state Senate vote. So uh, follow my page and I will let you know about the details and who to contact to express uh, your views on the bill. Until next time, thanks for watching. Be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to stay up to date with what's going on in the no-kill movement. Yeah.